indeed a privilege to join you today. I bring greetings from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention. It's a distinct honor to have this opportunity to join you this morning. A colleague of mine told me that one not be eternal in order to be everlasting, so I'll keep my remarks fairly brief. The focus of our work within the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention, and specifically within my office, is partnerships. Partnerships are central to all that we do because we know HIV AIDS, like many other health issues, cannot be addressed by a single entity, whether a large federal agency or by an individual church. But we know when we combine our time, talent, and resources, anything becomes popular. I'm reminded of the story of Lazarus and the account of Lazarus' healing in, in, his, in Christ's ministry. And one of the stories, is, one of the attributes of that story that's so compelling to our work is this notion of friends carrying him on a pallet, cutting a hole in the roof, and lowering him down. What we need in HIV prevention is people who are willing to go the extra mile to carry their friends and neighbors, to carry critical information, to cut holes in roofs, and lower friends and family down. So with that, it's a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to talking more about the Advocates Aid Leadership Initiative and some of the other activities that we're working with in conjunction with the SCLC Foundation and many other historical How do you feel about working with SCLC's Hades chapter to decrease the risk of the spread of the virus because about 15% of the population is affected, and that number is growing every day. Mm -hmm. And um, we'd like to, first of all, thank the fact that we had our international chapter here from Haiti, and that they were um, very interested in partnering to do some things in the future. Um, on behalf of uh, the partnerships team, I want to tell you that we welcome the opportunity to learn more about your organization and learn specifically what we can do to support <coughs> what is going on in your country. Our work is domestically based, but I would say, based upon our work with the SCLC Foundation, that there are some specific strategies and tactics that we think could benefit and be applicable to your, your respective country. Central to that is doing precisely what we're doing today, which is having a dialogue, which is beginning the conversation, which is getting people educated, engaged, and mobilized. And I would challenge you, as I would challenge everybody here, to take this conversation beyond the confines of this room and this time. Have a conversation on the ride home, then have a conversation with a family member, then have a conversation with a friend, and really talk about the burden of this issue among African Americans and in any other country, and really continue the dialogue. When we have these um, settings, we're always inspired and energized and engaged, but it's so critically important to continue that beyond this. But I will say this, from testing rates and from testing data, we do know that African American women are much more receptive to getting HIV tested than African American men. I don't have to tell you much about African American men to tell you that we are generally hesitant and reluctant to have a, a, a physician intervention or go see a doctor unless we are in chronic late stages of any illness or infirmity, and that's very regrettable. And that's part of why we see morbidity and mortality among African American men being so high. I'll say this though, I think there's an assumption that African American women um, aren't engaging in behaviors that put them at risk when in fact we know that our African American community as a whole is at risk. Every time you have a engage in a sexual risk behavior, as Dr. Millett alluded to earlier, you put yourself at risk. One of the other background players in this epidemic is the STD epidemic. And when I say it's an epidemic, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not using hyperbole. When you have an STD, as many African-American men and women have, you are seven times more susceptible to HIV infection. So if you look at this confluence of STDs in the background, background HIV prevalence, engaging in risk behaviors within small social networks, that provides a perfect storm for African-American women and men to be much more susceptible to HIV infection. One additional point that applies to African-American women as well as African-American men is this notion of what and when we are tested. There's an assumption that when every African-American woman goes to have her annual physical exam um, with her OB that she's getting tested for HIV. That is not the case. That is not the case. Unless a physician offers you an HIV test or unless you ask for one, you cannot assume that you're getting tested. People assume that when they get a physical test, when they're going for employment, or when they're going to um, get a physical exam for sports for high school, that they're getting tested. You are not. 
So the only way to know is to ask for it by name. We've heard that jingle used before. It remains true for HIV testing as well. SELC is providing free HIV testing as we speak in the lower level of this church. So as we give you information, I want you to make that first step to go and get tested. It's free, will not cost you a dime, and will take less than 20 minutes. They will not draw blood, they will not stick you, they will not hurt you. They will take a little Q-tip and rub it on the inside of your mouth. In fact, if you want to one at a time, you can go down and get a test, and by the time we get through talking, you'll get the results of that test. Now, don't everybody run out at one time, you know. But please, we will be here testing until 4 p.m. And that is the courtesy of the Cab County Health Department and AIDS Atlanta. I'll start with Brian White and, and tell you that I'm not a subject matter expert in the area of Brian White funding, but I can tell you that Brian White funding is indeed a complex decision-making process. Essentially, CDC undertakes a process of community engagement um, to determine how and what, at what level um, grantees will receive Brian White dollars, and that requires pretty rigorous application process, specific set of criteria, and then that information and that medication is distributed on the state level. One of the key issues with Ryan White is its funding. It's been frankly limited and its capacity has not been increased for quite some time. And the scale at which the administration and our government is able to allocate funds for Ryan White are directly related to our overall budget. And I can tell you the CDC's HIV prevention budget <laughs> has been flat for the last 10 years. And when included with inflation, that budget has actually decreased. So part of the complexity of that, we also know that many people are, who are white, Ryan White recipients have a number of people who are on ADAP program or treatment program waiting lists. So there's, frankly, a substantial demand, limited resources, and a challenge associated with getting that information out to many other people. I wish I could give you a clear, easy answer to that, but I can just affirm that it is indeed complicated. And I'll allow anybody else in the panel to give a, a, a personal um, response to that as well. Um, with regard to civic and social organizations, there are opportunities to, for civic and social organizations to support this effort. Many of them, many of this, much of this work starts on the community level. Partnering with churches, partnering with organizations like the Balm and Gilead, which is an organization that has been doing this work under leadership of Pernessa Seal for decades becoming a member of that organization, working with your state and local health departments. I promise you, we do a lot of presentations and we have a, the privilege of speaking a lot of different faith settings and churches. If you, there is somebody at a local health department who doesn't believe that churches are interested in this issue. There's somebody in a uh, local health department who's not sure if this is a safe place for people to be engaged in this issue. And when you pick the phone and say, my name is John Smith, I'm concerned about this issue and I'm committed to making a difference, you're going to likely get an answer because there's this disconnect between what people perceive of the church and what we found here and what we're finding more and more. People are interested and are prepared to submit and commit to this effort. Be you a church, civic social organization, there is room for everybody at this table because the problem is just that significant. One of the ways the CDC on a national level works with civic and social organizations is in support of the Act Against AIDS Leadership Initiative, which is a consortium of currently 16, increasing to 22, um, civic and social, faith-based, um, and leadership organizations addressing HIV AIDS, primarily among African Americans, but increasingly across Hispanic and Latinos and other risk groups. So that's one way we do that, but it's by no means the only way you can become involved. And third, you know, a uh, pastor pulled me aside after a, a similar conversation and a rich dialogue and asked me, you know what, I don't know the first thing about HIV, and I don't know if I'm going to really be prepared to stand in front of my past, my, in front of my congregation and talk about passing out condoms. Hmm. So where can I begin? And my response to him was the truth. Homelessness prevention is HIV prevention. Housing is HIV prevention. Hope is HIV prevention. HIV is not exclusively a clinical manifestation. It's not exclusively a virus. It's not driven exclusively by social networks and some of these other technical terms that we've thrown out today. It is because of a whole host of social determinants that really drive this epidemic. And social determinants means just the social issues in the environment that we live in. The late access to care, limited access to care, stress, 
um, limit intense social networks, all sorts of different societal pressures, all those things make for that perfect storm I referenced earlier that really drive this epidemic. So if you want to start somewhere, go to your food bank. If you want to start somewhere, work with your uh, deaconess board or deacons board to talk about health in general and then weave in an HIV prevention message. But by all means, start.